So here are the four things we're going to look at. We're going to look at the God of peace first. Uh, and then we're going to look at peace with God, the peace of God, and finally, peace with others. And I believe today that God wants us to not just talk about peace, but to experience it too. Our first reading today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O oh, man, how, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the, the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Okay, um, I've been given the wonderful task of talking to you about God's peace and just want to give you a reflection on my experience of God's peace. Um, when you've lived as long as I have, yes, I do feel a lot older than I look, um, I could go through my back catalogue and uh, for examples of where God has been faithful. And um, but then I thought, no, why not share something current, something that's happening now? Um, in November, just in November gone, I started to feel poorly. Um, and it was that kind of uncomfortable poorly where you're not quite sick enough to be off work, but you're barely well enough to work. And it's that horrible in between. Um, my symptoms were erratic. Uh, so doctors at many different times, different treatment regimes, and they still couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Um, I prayed for healing. It didn't come. I also asked for prayer from um, a home group from POMS and for other individuals. And, um, and there was no change, or at least nothing that I could perceive. Anyway, um, things escalated and I let my fear get the better of me. Um, I wasn't sleeping well um, and I was just fraught with anxiety. <clears throat> then something changed. Um, something told me, and looking back, um, it was the spirit. I was looking at things the wrong way around, back to front. Um, that night, I lay all my fears down, my worries about everything that was going on, fears for my family, if things turned out to be far more serious than, than um, as things went on, um, the fears of my fears, my frustrations. Um, to be honest with you, I held nothing back. God got a ripping. Um, however, in the midst of that, um, I clearly remember thinking, um, yeah, I clearly remember hearing and thinking just these words, be still and know that I am the Lord. Um, and in that moment, I stopped in my tracks and, uh, and, and, and suddenly I knew the maker of heaven and earth has got my back. That changed everything. Um, I slept well that night after a long time of not sleeping well. And in the morning, I was a different person. Now, not long afterwards, um, the following verse, the, the, the following um, verse spoke to me in my devotions. Um, let this is from John fourteen one. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now Jesus knows me. I'm prone to forget, and He was gently reminding me that, chill, Yamba. I've got this. I've got you. Um, and as I spend time with Him in prayer and in His Word, the reminders just keep on coming just gently reminding me. Um, I'm not perfect, but he's, he continues, continues reminding me that he's, he's all over this. So coming full circle, you might be wondering, so how am I doing now? Um, outwardly, not much has changed. Um, I still need to keep an eye on, on the symptoms um, and I, I need to have follow-up checkups. I've been diagnosed with a chronic condition that, that should get better over time. Inwardly though, I have only what I could describe as a godly peace. My perspective has changed, knowing that God only wants good for me, and he's got this. He's in control, and I can rest in him. 
His purposes might remain a mystery, but if just me sharing this little story with you now is a blessing and encouragement to just one of you, that, that's good enough for me. Um, and I'll end now with the, the, the snippet of the verse that came to mind as I started this story. It's from Psalm 46, and this is verses one, and then jump down to 10. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. I praise his name. Amen. Good afternoon, folks. Hope you're all okay and I hope you've enjoyed the sunshine today. So today we're looking at the subject of peace as part of our series of what God is like. Uh, and of course, this relates to the Bible reading plan that we are currently reading through as well. So I'm going to break this topic down into four easily digestible parts. Now this week, the youth have been making tasty pizzas. So if this topic was a pizza, then we could slice the pizza into four pieces. Um, I got that one in uh, just to, in, just for Kelvin's benefit there. <laughs> so here are the four things we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at the God of peace first, uh, and then we're going to look at peace with God, the peace of God, and finally, peace with others. And I believe today that God wants us to not just talk about peace, but to experience it too. So let's dive in. Number one, the God of peace. So what does the Bible tell us about what God is like in regard to peace? Romans 15 describes God as the God of peace. And of course, as we know from Christmas time, Isaiah announced the names by which Jesus will be called when he is to be born 700 years into the future. In Isaiah 9, he says, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. Isn't that great? Isn't that glorious news? There will be no end to peace. And then, of course, when Jesus was born, the multitude of the heavenly host praised God, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We read that in Luke 2. It's as if they were saying, here comes the Prince of Peace to bring peace to his people. So one of the names of God, therefore, is Jehovah Shalom. He himself is our peace. That, again, is such, such good news, so reassuring. So we've looked at how God is about peace. So what about having peace with God? And here's a question. Who in the whole history of humanity do you think has had the most peace ever apart from Jesus? Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a clue. It's not me. Um, I think it's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. So Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they walked with God for years, enjoying perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with each other, and a perfect relationship with the world they lived in. Everything was perfect. Everything was in its place. In particular, they gladly submitted or yielded to God's rule in their lives. God was God. They were submissive to him and they enjoyed the full blessing of his presence and favor. Now, I like how in the USA, road signs at junctions are labeled with the word yield instead of what we have in this country, which is give way. Uh, it's like the sign is shouting a command to yield, to submit to other road users at that junction. 
Uh, but of course, for Adam and Eve, then came the temptation to not submit to God and to grab for themselves the control of determining what was right and wrong in their own eyes. As it were, they were at the road junction saying, I want to go forward when I choose, not when you tell me to, and I'm not going to yield. And of course, you can imagine what chaos would occur at road junctions if that's the attitude that people had at yield signs or, or, or give way signs. And of course, that led to a downward spiral of devastation and pain and death. Where since then, things have most certainly not been in their rightful place. The Old Testament is littered with this damning assessment about people who did not submit to God's rule over what was right and wrong, particularly with Samson and all over the book of Judges, where it says people did what was right in their own eyes. And compare that to the Garden of Eden, where God had the right to determine what was right and wrong. So sin has catastrophically broken our ruin and ruined our peace with God. Now, in this house, we are very grateful to be able to have two separate spaces to work in when Joe and myself are both working at home at the same time. In the room Joe works in, everything is in its place and the room itself <laughs> is peaceful. I, I love being in that room. I'm not allowed to work in there, of course. Uh, but the room I work in upstairs is cluttered and chaotic, which represents the state of my mind most of the time. So th there's something peaceful in that comparison. There's something peaceful about things being in their proper place. So how do we get peace with God? How do we get things in their proper place with our relationship with God. Well, we need to submit to him, like we've just heard about in the Garden of Eden, by allowing God to be God in our lives, by yielding to his control, and by needing him, which, of course, all these things are the opposite of sin, of course. So this, then, is why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, because he heals our ruined relationship with God. And that leads us into our third point, the peace of God or having inner peace. So once we are right with God, once we have peace with God, God then wants to fill us with his peace through his Holy Spirit, not just to know peace in our minds, but to experience it and live it in our souls. And the readings that we've had from Scripture already illustrate this point. Today's first song spoke of Jesus being our steadfast love, our deep and boundless peace. I love those words. Are you experiencing deep and boundless peace today? Let's hear a testimony of someone who was most certainly not at peace, but who then encountered Jesus. We'll let him describe his experience in his own words. He's not with us today, so I'm going to read out what he would say if he was here. His name is Peter, and he was one of Jesus' best friends, but his life was in turmoil after he shamefully denied he knew Jesus three times before Jesus was crucified. So if Peter was giving us his own testimony today in his own words, he might say something like this. After I denied Jesus three times, I was overwhelmed by crushing guilt and remorse. In the upper room, on the third day after Jesus was crucified, some of the women came in very excited, saying they had seen our Lord alive. But when at last it came to choices, 
I denied I knew his name. So even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. What on earth would he think of me now after what I've done? Then suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me, his arms held open wide. And I fell onto my knees and clung to him and cried. And then as he raised me to my feet and looked into my eyes, love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. All the guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release. And every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace. As I finally understood, he's alive. And he died to take away my sins. I'm free of all my guilt and shame. Heaven's arms are open wide for me. Peter went from crushing guilt to glorious peace when he understood that Jesus had washed away his sin. And this is what Romans 5 verse 1 means, as we heard earlier. Since we have been justified, made right with God by faith, therefore we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This week's reading plan reminds us that peace does not equal perfection. Our peace should not depend on our circumstances. In fact, we can have peace in the midst of a storm. And it's great what Yamba just shared earlier about his experience of how he could have inner peace, even though outwardly he, there were situations in his life where he wasn't comfortable and wasn't at peace. Again, God is after not our comfort, but our inner peace. And this also was the experience of Horatio Spafford, who wrote the song, one of the songs that we sung just now, who in the midst of shattering grief at the loss of all his daughters at sea, wrote the words we sung earlier. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole of it, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. And you can hear him bursting into praise. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. And that was in the middle of his shattering grief. Are you experiencing guilt and shame? Like Peter earlier, perhaps? Then come to Jesus and let him melt that into peace. You too can receive the same experience of bliss at this glorious truth. Psalm 119 tells us that great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Again, you see the point about submission there, where everything is in its place. And reading the words of Jesus, you can feel the depth of his love and desire for our peace. Let not your hearts be troubled, he said. And I have said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. And that's what he wants to do for us today. And on to our last point, peace with others. So once we have peace with God, and experience the peace of God, we can and must then show peace to others. Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's what we show when we blossom and flourish. And there's some commands in the New Testament too about peace. Showing peace to others is clearly not optional. Romans 14 says, pursue what makes for peace. And in Romans 12, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. 
And in Colossians, as Mark read for us earlier, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's an action that we need to take. Allow it to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In Ephesians Ephesians 4, Paul says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And the author of Hebrews says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So folks, it matters how we treat others. It matters what's in our hearts. It matters that we display genuine, authentic fruit. It's not like cheap knockoff electrical gadgets that can actually be more dangerous than genuine products. There's no shortcuts or cheap ways of being fruitful. And we've learned that from our studies on the, the, you know, the everyday walking with Jesus, with Jesus before Christmas. But remember, this display of peace, this fruitful blossoming of peace comes from having peace with God and receiving the peace of God. We can't display God's peace if we don't have it ourselves. And so therefore, I want us now to have a time of reflection where we receive God's peace. It's an opportunity now to have peace with God if you are resisting yielding control of your life to him or maybe resenting the posture of submitting to him. And it's an opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to bring peace into our souls and to melt our fears and anxieties. And it's an opportunity to ask God to come and bring his peace into any broken relationships that we have with others. In Numbers 6, God told Moses what Aaron the high priest should say when he blessed the people. So this is not Aaron's prayer or his own words of blessing. But this is what God himself says over his people. In many churches, this is known as the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance or his face upon you and give you peace. It's been a beautiful sunny weekend here. When we go out and stand in the sunshine after a cold, dark, wet winter, we enjoy the warmth of the light of the sunshine, literally the radiated glory of the sun on our faces. This is what God wants us to experience today in our hearts, the warmth and blessing of the light of the sunshine of his face upon us.